All right, guys, welcome back. Today, we're going to finish up the chapter on the integumentary system. We left off talking about the epidermis. We talked about the layers in the epidermis, as well as the cells that are present. One of the types of cells that we mentioned is the melanocyte. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the melanocyte right now, because we're going to spend a few slides focusing on skin color. Now, skin color is influenced by multiple different things. It can be influenced by blood circulation, so that's where the blood is flowing and what's in the blood. So is it oxygenated or not? We'll focus on that in a second. Um, skin color can also be influenced on pigments, which we're gonna talk about on this slide. There are pigments like melanin, which is a typical skin pigment. And then there are things like carotene, which is an odd thing. Um, it typically is not coloring our skin, but we're gonna use it as an example to show you that there are times when odd pigments accumulate in the skin. Some disease states also adjust skin color. So for example, jaundice refers to a yellow or yellowish orange skin color that occurs because of a buildup or increased bilirubin. So bilirubin is a waste product. It's made in the body all the time um, and it's a waste. We rely on our liver to get rid of it. So there's always some bilirubin in the blood and the liver's responsible for cleaning that bilirubin out. Bilirubin happens to be a yellow pigment. Um, typically, it doesn't affect skin color at all. But if there's a problem with the liver, so liver failure, hepatitis, we see this in premature infants whose liver is not developed well, if a bile duct is blocked, um, and any of these situations where there's an issue with the liver, the liver doesn't clean the bilirubin out of the blood and the bilirubin builds up. So we end up with a lot of this yellow pigment building up. And the result is that the skin ends up looking yellow. It typically will just start out in like the whites of the eyes, um, but it can end up causing all of the skin to be very, very yellow, almost like yellowish orange sometimes. And it is drastic. It can be really, really drastic. But that's a disease state, right? The skin isn't typically colored by bilirubin. That's only when the liver is having issues. Um, carotene is another thing that can color the skin or can affect skin color, but it doesn't normally. It's just a weird situation. What carotene is, is an orangish yellow pigment that we find in orange vegetables, right? Specifically carrots, right? Hence carrots, carotene. Um, carrots are called carrots because they contain a large amount of carotene. Now, typically in your body, you convert carotene into vitamin A. And that's great, you use that vitamin A, it's really good for you. Um, people always associate it with vision, specifically night vision, um, which is true, it does help night vision. So typically eating carrots is good. You convert carotene to vitamin A and you use that vitamin and everything is wonderful. However, if you eat a ton of carrots, and I mean a lot, then you can overwhelm the conversion um, and you, you stop converting it to vitamin A, or you can't convert all of it to vitamin A. Um, you're converting it as fast as you can, but you start to get a buildup of carotene. And that carotene happens to like epidermal cells and the adipose tissue or fat tissue that's in the dermis and hypodermis. So you eat a ton of carrots, okay? you can't convert it to vitamin A fast enough, so you start to store the carotene and you happen to store it in your skin. So now all of a sudden you have this orange pigment that you're storing in your skin. So the skin can turn orange. This happens. 
Um, again, it's a really rare, weird thing, but like if a patient changes their diet all of a sudden and they're on one of these, you know, fad diets or they're just trying to eat really healthy and they're eating, you know, a couple bags of carrots a day because that's what they snack on all the time. Um, the skin can start to appear orange and they will freak out. Um, but all you have to do is cut back on the carrots. If you just stop eating them, your body will start to process that carotene. And then after that, you can eat them normal, um, like one serving a day, and it'll go away. It's not permanent. And it's not harmful. So again, that's rare. Um, melanin is a pigment that always affects our skin color, and it affects everyone's skin color unless we have some sort of a disease where we can't make melanin. We'll talk about that in a second. So what melanin is, is melanin is a pigment that's made in our melanocytes down in the stratum basal. So if you think about your skin, right, and you have your curvy line up, that's all your epidermis. The stratum basal is this bottom layer down here, and that's made up mostly of basal cells. But we said every so often in the stratum basal, we have a melanocyte. And the melanocyte has its body down here, but it has these arms that reach up like this throughout the epidermis. And this melanocyte produces this pigment for us. It produces this melanin, and then it releases it in these little transport vesicles called melanosomes. And the little vesicles will spread out throughout the epidermis and then they'll burst and they release the melanin. So what you end up with is melanin spread throughout the keratinocytes. Okay, so melanin is made in the melanocytes, but then it gets released and it gets dispersed throughout the um, keratinocytes. That's why you should have a, an even color throughout the skin. Now, we know that um, <clears throat> melanin is not just there to give us our skin color. It does, but its real purpose is to protect from UV radiation. Now, melanin is different in different people, right? That's why we all have different skin color. Um, it can be a yellowish color. It can be a really light brown, like tan. It can be brown. It can be really dark brown. It can be like a blackish color. So there's all different types um, or colors of this melanin pigment. And depending on how dark, you're it, how dark your melanin is, your skin color can change. Um, here we see a melanocyte. All right, so the basement membrane, remember, is just this, this thin layer that separates the um, dermis from the epidermis and then the very bottom layer here of the epidermis would be the stratum basal right so this whole layer is the stratum basal most of the cells down here are the basal cells that are just dividing but then we have our melanocytes big cell you notice the processes that reach up and out to kind of spread out um, <clears throat> From the tip of these, you'll see a little vesicle pinches off and the vesicle has melanin in it, right? The vesicles get transferred out to, um, transferred out to the keratinocytes and then they release the melanin and you end up with this, right? Just the melanin pigment spread throughout the keratinocytes. So um, melanocytes produce melanin. And again, we said that the melanin gives us our skin color, but that's not the purpose. The purpose of it isn't to make us pretty. Um, the purpose of it is to protect the, um, the skin as well as the tissues underneath from UV radiation from the sun. Now we do need a little bit of UV radiation. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but we do need a little bit of UV radiation so that we can make vitamin D3, but we only need very, very little. Um, any more than that and the UV radiation can start to damage our skin. The problem with this UV radiation is one, it can actually cause burns, right? Burns to the skin, um, but it also causes 
DNA mutations. And remember, our DNA is very important. The DNA tells the cells what to do. So if you mess up that DNA, the cell does not know how to behave any longer, right? And that's when cancer can start to develop. So UV radiation can cause um, burns, right? Damage, actual physical damage. It can cause wrinkles, not a big deal, but we don't want them. And then cancer, which is a big deal. Okay, so we wanna protect from that UV radiation. Melanin does that. The more melanin um, and the darker the melanin, the more protection there is. Now the skin darkens with an increase in melanin production not the number of melanocytes. The number of melanocytes that a person has um, is, is standard, that's coded in their DNA. But those melanocytes can be really active or they can be you know, kind of sluggish. When you go out in the sun, your melanocytes say, oh, okay, like I, I see that there's a lot of radiation coming down, I need to release more melanin. So they make more melanin. And that's why your skin tans after being in the sun, right? It's not instant. Um, it takes a little bit of time and it kind of starts slow and then the skin darkens and darkens and darkens as that melanin is produced. And then um, the tan doesn't last forever though, right? A tan fades because um, you go out of the sun and then the melanocytes say, oh, okay, let's go back down to normal production. And you have that melanin there but the melanin slowly gets broken down. So the tan slowly goes away. Now, this is what we see in lighter skinned individuals. There are darker skinned individuals who always have a, um, a greater level of melanin production and melanin that's darker and melanin that's released more superficially. So in darker skinned individuals, there is always a greater um, amount and level of melanin present. So the skin appears darker. Darker skinned individuals also have better protection against UV radiation. because there's more melanin and the melanin is closer to the surface, it's able to block more of that UV radiation from getting through. So um, there's less skin cancer in darker skinned individuals than there is in lighter skinned individuals. Um, <clears throat> when somebody is albino, what that means is that their melanocytes do not produce any melanin. So they have the cells present in the stratum basal, but they don't work. There's a problem with the DNA and the recipe, the gene that says how to make melanin um, does not work properly. So the, they can't make any melanin at all. So there's zero skin color, right? There's absolutely no color. The skin actually appears kind of pinkish because um, of the blood vessels because the blood that you can see through the skin, but it's really, really white pinkish color. Um, same thing with the hair. The hair color also comes from melanin, which we'll talk about at the end of this lecture. Um, so if you can't make melanin, you can't make hair coloring. Um, so the hair also appears white in color. The initial burn, like when someone, especially someone with lighter skin, the initial burn, that redness, that's actually like tissue damage. That's um, cells bursting and inflammation, um, and it's an actual tissue damage process that's coming. Um, the melanin happens more slowly. Okay, so skin color is affected by um, some pigments like carotene and bilirubin. Um, it's also affected by melanin. And then we said that skin color was affected by blood flow, right? How much um, blood or where the blood is flowing, how much blood's flowing at the surface of the skin and what's in the blood. Is it oxygenated blood or not? So the blood 
is full of these cer certain cells called red blood cells. That's what RBC is, red blood cell. So our blood is full of red blood cells. Um, red blood cells make up about half of the volume of our blood. And red blood cells contain um, something called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a pigment that's typically like a reddish color. It kind of changes, but it's, it's a reddish type color. That's why we call them red blood cells because they're full of this red pigment hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin is responsible for carrying oxygen and CO2 through the bloodstream. So that's the thing that actually picks up oxygen and then carries it to your tissues. Now, hemoglobin, I said, can kind of vary in color. When oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin, it's a really, really bright red. When there's no oxygen bound to the hemoglobin, it's a much deeper, darker color that almost appears bluish. So like reddish, purplish, bluish. It appears much deeper and darker. It doesn't have that bright red color any longer. So where the blood is flowing can affect the skin and what's in the blood. So first off, where the blood is flowing. When we are hot, the superficial blood vessels dilate. Dilate means open or get bigger. They do this to bring the blood up to the surface. Remember we said when we're hot, we bring the blood to the surface and then we coat the skin with sweat. And when the sweat evaporates, it takes that heat energy away from the blood and cools the blood off. Then as it flows through the rest of the body, it's bringing cooler temperature blood through the body and that cools the body. Okay, so when we're hot, the blood vessels at the surface of the skin dilate or get bigger and they bring more blood to the surface. If there's more blood close to the surface, that means that the skin is going to redden, right? It's going to get more red in color. Again, this is visible much more in people with lighter skin. The lighter the skin is, the easier it is to see this. If the skin is very, very, very dark, this isn't apparent. Um, however, if you look at somebody with really light skin who's just gone outside in, in you know, 85 degree weather and run around the block and they come back, they're going to be flushed, especially in the face and the chest area. Okay? That's because blood's coming to the surface. Um, <clears throat> the opposite is true. Um, when cold, um, when an individual is cold, the blood leaves the surface because we don't want to radiate heat. We don't want to lose heat from it. So the blood all stays in towards the core of the body where it's more insulated. That also allows it to keep these important organs more warm. So think about it. When you're really, really cold, the coldest parts of you are typically your fingertips and your toes, right? Or your feet and your hands. Um, because the blood's not worried about those areas. The blood all stays in towards the core of the body. Um, and because of that, because the blood flow at the surface decreases, so blood flow at the surface decreases, that means that the skin pales. So um, where the blood is can make the skin more red or more pale. Cyanosis is something that occurs um, when there's not enough oxygen in the blood. So um, what cyanosis is, is a bluish tint to the skin. So when the, t when the skin turns blue, we say that someone is cyanotic, right? They have cyanosis. Um, <clears throat> the reason that the skin turns blue is because there's a severe reduction in oxygenation. Okay, so what that means is that there's not enough oxygen in the blood. Remember, I told you guys that when oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, it's really bright red. But when there's no oxygen, it's a much deeper, darker, bluish color. 
Um, that's why like the vessels that you see um, in your arms, those are veins. Veins are really close to the surface and arteries are down deep. Well, veins carry deoxygenated blood. They carry blood that doesn't have oxygen and they look blue, right? So when all the vessels um, have blood that looks blue, the skin can actually have a bluish tint. It can look more blue. Um, we typically first see this, this in areas where there's a ton of blood vessels right at the surface and the skin is like is thin. So we first see it in the lips and then under the nails. And if you think about it, both of those areas are normally pink or red, right? Why are they red? Because there's a bunch of oxygenated blood right at the surface, right? So there's a bunch of blood at the surface of your lips. They look red. Bunch of surface, the nail, the nail bed, or a bunch of blood, sorry, at the nail blood, nail bed that looks red. Well, if the blood is no longer red and it's all blue, those areas are going to turn blue. Okay, so again, that's when there's not enough oxygen available. So examples of this, um, drowning, right? When you pull someone out of a pool, they obviously have not been breathing underwater. So frequently they'll be cyanotic. Um, they'll have turned blue, especially in the lips. Um, <clears throat> choking, right? A choking victim, um, you're blocking oxygen, they'll turn blue. A severe asthma attack. Hey, somebody will turn blue or can turn blue, as well as in some other lung conditions or lung issues. Um, there are a lot of different kind of emergency situations that can happen with the lungs where someone stops breathing. Um, but in any case, if they're not getting enough oxygen, they can become cyanotic or turn blue. All right, so changing gears from skin color. Um, we mentioned that one of the functions of the integumentary system is the production of a vitamin D3. Um, our epidermal cells, so cells in the epidermis, produce vitamin D3. It's also called cholecalciferol. Uh, that's why we call it D3, because cholecalciferol is quite a mouthful. Um, the epidermal cells produce this in the presence of UV radiation. So sun, that's why I said you do need a little bit of sun, not a lot. Like walking to and from your car every day is enough sun for you to produce vitamin D3. Now, this vitamin D3 is produced in the skin and then it enters the blood and flows through the bloodstream and it ends up going to your liver and then your kidneys. And your liver and your kidneys work together to convert that vitamin D3 into a hormone called calcitriol. I remember that these go together, that vitamin D3 gets turned into calcitriol because tri means three, right? So three tri, vitamin D3 goes into calcitriol. So calcitriol is a hormone that's important in um, allowing us to absorb enough calcium and phosphorus from the GI tract. We're mostly worried about the calcium. So you need vitamin D in order to absorb calcium from your GI tract. That's why when you go to um, you know, Publix or CVS or whatever, look at the vitamin aisle next time and look at all the calcium. A lot of the calcium comes with vitamin D in it. It's calcium plus D because it doesn't make sense to take the calcium if you're not going to absorb all of it. So you need enough vitamin D3 in order to stimulate the absorption from the GI tract into your body. Insufficient vitamin D3, so not having enough, excuse me, not having enough vitamin D can cause a disease called rickets. Um, <clears throat> rickets is associated with weak bones that bend or bow under pressure. So 
calcium gets packed into our bones and that's what makes our bones strong. That's what makes them able to stand up with all of our weight pushing down and not change, not bend, not bow out. So if we don't have enough vitamin D, we don't have enough calcium, which means the bones aren't strong. Um, and this is an example of what can happen with the legs um, in somebody who has rickets. All right, so finally, we're moving down to the dermis. Um, when we look at the skin, remember the epidermis is on the top and the dermis is the region that is deep to the epidermis. It's located underneath the epidermis and it's sandwiched between the epidermis and the hypodermis or subcutaneous layer. The dermis is responsible for anchoring all of the accessory structures. So like the hair follicles and the hair root go down into the dermis. Um, sweat glands are located down in the dermis. There are numerous different um, sense receptors that are present in the dermis. Okay, so all of these living structures are down in the dermis. The dermis also provides um, <clears throat> blood to the epidermis. Or not really blood, but it provides stuff like oxygen and nutrients. Because remember, the epidermis does not have its own blood vessels. It doesn't have its own blood supply. So the blood vessels travel up to the very top of the dermis and then out. And that provides all of the necessary stuff to the deep parts of the epidermis. Um, the dermis is broken up into two compartments or two, um, components or two regions. The outer area is the papillary layer. That's just this small top part up here where the dermal papilla are. And then the deep area, which is much larger, is the reticular layer. So the papillary layer, um, which again is the top or superficial part of the dermis, is made out of areolar connective tissue. Um, this is the loose connective tissue that's got collagen and elastic fibers. Um, the reticular layer down deep is also connective tissue. So the whole dermis is connective tissue. Um, the papillary layer contains small capillaries, um, which are just blood vessels. These are the blood vessels that supply parts of the epidermis with nutrients and oxygen and whatever else it needs. Um, there are some small lymphatics. Those are just um, lymph vessels. So part of the lymphatic system, which is closely associated with the immune system. And there are some small um, sensory neurons or sensory receptors that are present up in the papillary layer. Remember that the um, border between the dermis and the epidermis is not flat, it is curved. So the papillary layer is where um, or contains the dermal papilla that project up between the epidermal ridges, right? So it goes like this, and these little fingers that reach up are the dermal papilla, right? And then the epidermal ridges are the parts of the epidermis that are going down. We talked about this numerous times already. We said that, that the curve increases the surface area so that it's a strong connection and that the specific pattern is what's responsible for creating your fingerprints. Now the reticular layer is the deep layer of the dermis. This is also connective tissue, but specifically dense, irregular connective tissue. If you think back to the, um, the tissues lab, remember that dense means there is a, um, a dense network of collagen fibers. So there's a ton of collagen that's present there to give it um, the, the layer strength. Irregular means that the collagen is, um, is irregular. It's not organized. So the collagen goes in like all different directions. It's not packed in nice and, and straight. Um, the reason for that is that it allows um, for strengthening of the dermis from all different angles. If the collagen is, is perfectly straight like this, like in a tendon, for example, 
that provides strength when it's pulled in, in these two directions. But the skin is stressed from all different angles, right? It's not like you know that the skin is only going to get pulled that way. No, the skin gets twisted and pulled and stretched in all different directions. So you need the collagen to be going in all different directions. So the collagen is, you know, curvy and it changes shape and it goes in all different ways so that it can um, provide strength from all different angles. There are all of the same things that we saw in the papillary layer, they're just bigger. So as you go down deeper in the body, the blood vessels get bigger, the lymphatic vessels get bigger, the nerve fibers get bigger. Again, um, <clears throat> this is connective tissue. It's got a lot of, of proteins, of fibers present. We see specifically a lot of collagen and elastin or elastic fibers. The collagen gives strength and the elastic fibers give flexibility. Obviously, the skin is highly elastic or highly flexible. We see that these, um, these protein fibers that are present extend or overlap up into the papillary region and down into the hypodermis. This is why there's not like a straight, strict line between the layers, um, between the dermis and the hypodermis. It's kind of blurred because the fibers extend down between the layers. The skin is innervated, um, which means it has nerve fibers present. Now, there are nerve fibers that are carrying messages into the skin, and there are nerve fibers that are associated with the sensory receptors that are carrying information out of the skin. So what a nerve is or nerve fiber is it's just like a, a highway system for electrical impulses in the nervous system. Um, so it carries signals up to the brain and then away from the brain. Think of it like a wire. So the nerve fibers that are going into the skin control um, blood flow and gland secretions. So for example, there's a nerve fiber that goes into the sweat glands and it tells the sweat gland when to release sweat. Um, there are nerve fibers that go into the blood vessels and they tell the blood vessels when they need to dilate to get bigger, when they need to constrict to get smaller. Right, so this is how we control things like secretions and blood flow. It's because the messages come from the brain and they travel along nerve fibers to get to these effectors like vessels and glands. Now, there are also nerve fibers that carry um, electrical signals or information out of, the, in, out of the dermis. So these are nerve fibers that are attached to the sensory receptors. So there are multiple different types of sensory receptors. And when they're stimulated, they send a signal to the central nervous system. And that's when we become aware of what it is that we're feeling, these, these touch senses. So there are multiple different types of sensory receptors because there are multiple different types of senses. Um, we'll just talk about a couple of them. We'll talk about tactile corpuscles, um, which are also called Meissner's corpuscles. These are located superficially up in the dermal papilla. So up towards the top of the dermis. When these tactile corpuscles or Meissner's corpuscles are squished, when they're stimulated, they send a signal up to the brain and that tells the brain that we're experiencing a light touch. Now, lamellated or lamellar corpuscles are also called Pacinian corpuscles are located down deeper in the dermis in the reticular layer. When these Pacinian or lamellar corpuscles are squished when they're stimulated, they send a signal up to the brain and that tells the brain that we're experiencing a deeper pressure. So there's light touch and then deeper touch. Now, if you think about their location, it makes complete sense right, what type of signal they're sending. Um, so up here in the dermal papilla, we have our tactile corpuscles or Meissner's corpuscles. This is the receptor 
and then it has a nerve that leaves the skin and goes up to the, the central nervous system. Then down deeper, there are Pacinian corpuscles or lamellar corpuscles. And they also have a nerve fiber that goes and you know carries the signal to the central nervous system. Now, in order to stimulate these um, receptors, they, they send a signal or fire when they're squished, like physically squishing them makes them fire a signal. So if you push on the skin, you push down on the epidermis just a little bit, you'll go down and you'll squish this receptor. So it makes sense that it's triggering light touch, right? If you only push lightly, you're not going to trigger this deep receptor right here. Right? So it's not going to send an information, information about deep pressure. If you really push down on the skin, that's when you'll trigger the Pacinian corpuscle. So if you've pushed down hard enough for this receptor to be firing, that tells your brain, okay, that must be pretty deep pressure. That must be put it, pushing pretty hard. Okay? So their location correlates with their function or their anatomy correlates with their physiology. Underneath the dermis, we have the hypodermis. Again, we said hypo means below. So the hypodermis is below the dermis. It's also called the subcutaneous layer because it's beneath the cutaneous membrane. The hypodermis or subcutaneous layer is made of connective tissue. Um, specifically, it has a lot of adipose tissue present, which you guys know is fat tissue. This fat that's present in the hypodermis provides insulation. It helps to keep um, warmth in and keep our temperature regulated. It acts as energy storage. Um, we store fatty acids. So fatty acids are stored as triglycerides. Um, we store a lot of fats in adipose tissue. There's some cholesterol, there's some fatty acids, but mostly we store the fatty acids as triglycerides. <clears throat> um, this, this, sub, this fat that's present there also acts as a shock absorber and then a stabilizer. It kind of fills in the open spaces so that everything is, is nice and full. The hypodermis is connected to the reticular layer of the skin um, by connective tissue fibers like collagen. Remember we said that the collagen um, is interwoven between the dermis and the hypodermis. So there's, there's a blurred line between the two layers. They're highly connected to each other. The hypodermis allows for a separate movement of the skin without damaging the tissue underneath. So the skin can move easily without the muscles underneath being pulled. Right, that's very important because if I if I pulled at the muscles underneath like I'm pulling at my skin, that would damage them. Um, finally, the hypodermis um, or subcutaneous layer is an important site for drug delivery. There are a lot of medications that we can't give by mouth because they would get broken down in the acid of the stomach. So we have to inject them. Now, if we inject it IV into the vein, we get a huge drug response right away. Um, and we don't always want that. So if we inject it into the subcutaneous region or subcutaneous layer, the drug slowly enters into the bloodstream. So we have more of a sustained effect um, and we avoid the GI tract. So um, insulin, for example, is one of the drugs that we inject um, subcutaneously. When we do that, the needles that we use, the little needles that um, go into the subcutaneous layer, we refer to as hypodermic needles, right? Hypodermic because it's the hypodermis. Okay, so we're done with the actual skin. Um, the rest of the lecture is gonna focus on the accessory structures, all of the, the extra stuff that's associated with the skin. Um, so hair and hair follicles, glands like sebaceous glands and sweat glands, and then nails are all accessory structures. Um, <clears throat> these accessory structures are typically located 
or anchored down in the dermis. However, they are derived from epidermal tissue. So um, in the embryo, when the embryo is developing, it's epidermis, epidermal tissue that ends up um, creating these accessory structures and then they make their way down into the dermis. Some of them project up through the skin surface. So hair, for example, we can see out past the skin. We'll start with hair. Um, the human body is covered with hair, except at a few very special locations. Um, one, the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. We have thick skin in that area. Um, because of that, that dense stratum lucidum and that thick stratum corneum, we don't have hair projecting up through that area. We don't have hair on the lips. Um, also portions of the eye and then portions of the external genitalia. So in men, that's portions of the penis. And in women, that is the labia minora which are the inner skin folds. Now, hair is not just beautiful. Um, hair is functional. We have it for a reason. One, hair provides protection um, from UV radiation. For example, there's a reason we have all this hair on our head. If you think about when we lived outside all the time and you're standing outside and the sun's beating down on your head, you really want to protect that area from UV radiation. Okay, so it does provide protection. Um, <clears throat> it also insulates the body. Another reason why we have hair on our head. Um, I think it's like 40% of heat loss comes from your head because of all the blood flow that's present there. Um, so having hair on the head helps to keep that heat in. Hair also guards the openings um, of the body. So any area where we don't have skin actually covering and we have an opening into the body, um, we typically have extra protection. So pathogens, um, bacteria, insects, dust, dirt, so that none of that gets into our body. Um, hair is a great way to protect an opening. So think about your eyes, right? We have eyelashes that kind of curl around and create this, this little cage around our eyes. And when there's dirt and dust in the air, you naturally squint, right? And then your eyelashes block the little opening that you have left. Your eyebrows are protective. Um, when sweat drips down your forehead, your eyebrows help to deviate it away from the eyes. Inside the nose, there's um, a bunch of hair in the nasal cavity, and that acts as a filter to stop the big particles from getting down into your lungs and your respiratory tract. Um, there's also hair in the pubic region, so hair protecting the entrance to the vagina and the urethra. Hey, um, <clears throat> trying to think where else. I think that is it for guarding the openings and exits. Finally, hair is sensitive to very light touch. And that seems weird because it's dead, right? Like this hair shaft out here is dead, but you can feel it moving. You can feel one single hair being moved. And that's because the root of the hair is surrounded by what's called a root hair plexus. These are really sensitive sensory nerves. Now, feeling a hair move might not seem that important to us right now, but again, back when we're hunters and gatherers out in the wild, that really is important. Um, think about like if there's a mosquito or some sort of a poisonous bug flying around you, you want to feel it and get rid of it before it bites you. To us, it doesn't really matter. But imagine if that um, mosquito was transferring or transmitting malaria. Now that's a really big deal right or out in the jungle where there's poisonous bugs at that in that time or in that setting it's important to notice really tiny changes now <clears throat> we'll talk about all the different parts of the hair starting with the hair follicle so the hair follicle is a casing that surrounds the root of the hair so it's a casing that's located down deep in the dermis surrounding 
the hair. Um, now, the, the hair follicle is actually epithelial tissue um, or tissue from the epidermis. You guys will see that the stratum basal, um, so like the stratum basal is going like this, it actually dips down to form the hair follicle and then continues. And if you think about what the stratum basal does in skin is it has cells that constantly divide. Well, the cells of the hair follicle also can divide in a certain area. So that allows us to um, produce the hair, right? And then the hair itself is non-living, it's dead. But because of this hair follicle with these fast dividing cells, we can actually produce hair. Um, the follicle gets wrapped in a dense connective tissue sheath for protection. There are a couple other structures that are associated with the root of the hair. Um, one of these is the erector pili muscle. This is an involuntary muscle that connects to the hair root. Um, what I mean by involuntary is that you do not consciously control it. It's not like your skeletal muscles that you tell to contract. This is controlled automatically by your autonomic nervous system. When the erector pili muscle stands, um, contracts, the hair stands up on end and you get goosebumps. Now we talked about this a bit in lab, so I'm not going to go through and talk about um, like the evolutionary functions of this and why this is important in animals. Um, but just to cue your memory, remember this erector pili muscle contracts when you are scared, right? When you're frightened for some reason and when you are cold. So go back and look at the lab video. Um, the hair also has sebaceous glands associated with it. Sebaceous glands produce something called sebum, and sebum is a really oily or lipid-rich um, secretion. These sebaceous glands um, release this oil onto the base of the hair in order to lubricate the hair and help it um, keep it from drying out. And then there's also antibacterial compounds that help to control bacteria and prevent them from getting in and infecting the hair follicle. The hair can be separated up into um, different regions. The root is the lower part of the hair that's beneath the surface of the skin. So all of this bottom area is the root of the hair that anchors the hair. Um, the shaft is the part of the skin that, ex or sorry, the part of the hair that extends past the surface of the skin. So this is the part that you can, you know, see and feel and brush and cut. That's the hair shaft. If you look here at this picture, um, you can also see the hair follicle. The hair follicle is this that's, that's wrapped around the root of the hair. Notice how it's coming from the epidermis. Right, so up here, this is all the epidermis. And you see that the epidermis goes down and surrounds the hair to create this hair follicle. You guys can also see the erector pili muscle right here connecting to the hair root. Um, the root hair plexus, you can see all these little nerves that are attached. And then you also see a sebaceous gland that makes oil and or sebum and releases it up onto the hair. Hair production begins at the base of the hair deep down in the dermis. Um, <clears throat> we see that at the bottom of the hair, there's this swollen region that's called the bulb. So the hair bulb is the swollen region. And at the very base of that, there's something called the hair papilla or dermal papilla. That is this, this little like nub of connective tissue that has blood vessels coming in and out. So that's where the blood supply is going into the living cells that are dividing, is at the papilla. Now the hair bulb, this widened portion right here, produces the hair matrix, which is a layer of dividing basal cells. And again, this is what actually produces the hair. 
And as the cells divide again and again and again, it pushes the hair up and out, and that is hair growth. So um, we just looked at how, you know, the stratum basal comes down and surrounds the hair. And just like in the stratum basal of the epidermis, these basal cells divide and divide and divide, and they push the cells up and up and up to make new skin cells. The same thing is happening in the hair. There are basal cells in this matrix that are dividing again and again and again, and they're pushing the hair up and up and up, and that's how the hair is growing. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm gonna skip to hair color really quick. Hair color is produced by melanocytes that are down by the hair papilla, down by this, this little connective tissue bulb. You'll notice that out just like surrounding it, you have little darkened areas, darkened cells that are where the melanocytes are. Um, the melanocytes make a melanin that pigments your hair. Again, just like skin, right? In skin, the basal cells divide to make new, um, new growth and melanocytes make the color of your skin. In the hair, basal cells divide to make growth, melanocytes make the color. Now there are a couple different types of hair. Vellus hairs are the soft, fine hairs that cover all of the body. They typically are um, a little bit less pigmented than the hair on the head is. Terminal hairs are thicker hairs that may be heavily pigmented. Obviously people with blonde hair um, don't have heavily pigmented terminal hairs, um, but a lot of people do. They're always though thicker hairs than the vellus hairs. We find terminal hairs um, on the head, the eyebrows, the eyelashes, and then other parts of the body after puberty. So this would be the pubic region, um, the axilla, right, or underarm, and then sometimes on men, um, you'll see it on the chest as well. We have um, multiple different classes or types of exocrine glands that are present in the skin. So these are glands that make secretions and release them onto the surface of the skin. We have sebaceous glands that produce sebum or oil. We just mentioned those with the hair. Um, frequently, sebaceous glands are associated with a hair follicle and they release their oil onto the hair. That's why the hair gets greasy if you don't wash it for a while. There are some sebaceous glands that can release their oil directly onto the skin surface to provide lubrication um, and moisturize the skin. We see that mostly on the face um, and the chest region. We also have sudoriferous glands, which are sweat glands. Um, and we have two different types of sweat glands that are present, apocrine glands and eccrine glands. Um, eccrine are also called merocrine, so either name is okay. Quickly, we'll just look at the different types of sebaceous glands um, or oil glands. Simple branched alveolar glands are the glands that are associated with hair follicles. Okay, so these are the ones that um, extend off of the hair follicle and they release their oil onto the root of the hair. Um, so these are the ones that why your hair gets oily if you haven't washed it for a few days. Um, Sebaceous follicles are sebaceous glands or oil glands that release the oil directly onto the skin surface. So they are structured a little bit differently um, when they're going into the hair versus when they're going onto the skin surface. Again, sebum is oil. It's an oily, fatty secretion. Um, it contains lipids and other ingredients to moisturize and lubricate the skin. Um, and the hair, and this provides a lot of protection. Again, for us now, I think we find it annoying, right? When you've got a, you know, your hair gets oily and you've got to wash it and you know, your skin gets oily, um, but it's actually protective, especially if you were living outside, you know, thousand years ago. 
um, and you've constantly got the wind beating on your face and the sun beating down on you and you're exposed to the elements and you don't have lotion. Um, in that case, having this oil to protect your skin and moisturize your skin is very helpful. Um, again, it also has uh, substances in it that inhibit bacterial growth. Here you see um, the different types of oil glands. This is the simple branched aviolar. Um, simple is just referring to this one stalk that's here and then that one stalk branches so simple branched um, <clears throat> again these ones make the sebum and put it onto the hair and then sebaceous follicles go directly onto the skin surface you'll notice that these are derived from um, epithelial tissue from the epidermis right this epidermis goes down and extends into the dermis We'll finish um, by quickly contrasting the different types of sudoriferous glands. Sudoriferous glands, we said again, are sweat glands, and we have apocrine sweat glands and eccrine sweat glands, um, eccrine or merocrine. Now we did talk about these um, in the lab video as well, so I'm not gonna go into huge detail on them and the function of them. We'll just quickly go through it. Um, apocrine glands are odd. They are not the normal sweat gland. They are found in areas where we get hair at puberty. So they're found in the underarms or axilla. Um, they're found in the groin. They can be found around the nipples, especially in men. Now these apocrine glands secrete their products into the hair follicle. Okay. Hence, they're found in areas where we get hair. Now, they become active at puberty, right? Because we don't have hair there until puberty. So once we've got hair there, the apocrine glands become active and they release their secretion. Now, their secretions are more of a, a sticky, cloudy kind of secretion and they cause much worse odor than the eccrine glands do. I'm not worried about the myoepithelial cells. Um, these glands produce their secretion in response to hormonal signals or um, when you're really nervous and worked up. So this is not to cool the body down. You don't have to worry about this. Merocrine or eccrine sweat glands are normal sweat glands. These are the sweat glands that produce sweat in order to cool the body off. Um, while we're cooling the body off, we also excrete water and electrolytes. Electrolytes are like salts, right? Like sodium and chloride ions. And the, the, the sweat does also flush microorganisms from the skin, but mostly these are there to cool the body off. Eccrine glands produce sweat to cool the body. These are the normal sweat glands. They're widely distributed throughout the body. We have more um, on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. So they're throughout the whole body though. Um, I'm not worried about the structure. These glands are active from birth, right? So we're able to produce sweat when we're hot from birth. The apocrine glands become active much later at puberty. Eggring glands are responsible for our sensible perspiration, right? The water that we intentionally secrete in order to cool the body off. Again, I'm not super worried about the structure. We do have a couple other types of glands, excuse this title. Um, we do have a couple other types of glands that are present in the integumentary system. Now these include mammary glands. Mammary glands are highly specialized glands that produce milk in response to a hormone called prolactin. Now this is covered in the reproductive system, right? Because this is part of reproduction. Um, Ceruminous glands produce something called cerumen. That's just a fancy name for earwax. 
Um, and then this gets released onto the epithelial surface in the ear with the ear canal. And that's there to protect the eardrum from things that might make their way into the ear. We did it, <laughs> yay. I didn't think I was gonna get through this in time. Um, so thanks for bearing with me. If you guys have any questions, shoot me an email or comment below and I will see you next chapter for the skeletal system.